Hello everyone, my name is Stephen Chung and I am a tax attorney in California. I am also a columnist at the legal website AboveTheLaw.com and my columns are published every Wednesday. Today with me I have Mr. Mark Richards who was the lead defense attorney in Kyle Rittenhouse's criminal defense trial. We'll be spending the next hour or so talking about Mark's background, some of the key aspects of the Rittenhouse trial from his perspective, and some of the lessons that can be learned from a case that has received national attention. And then we'll conclude our discussion with Mark sharing some of the secrets of his success in law practice and his advice on handling high-profile cases such as this one. Mark, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. One administrative note, if any of the listeners live in Southern California or plan to be in the area on May 12th, the Westside Bar Association will be hosting an MCLE event at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in Beverly Hills. This event will feature Mr. Richards along with a panel of experts who will discuss the Rittenhouse trial in greater detail. This panel will include a jury consultant and a representative from the LA District Attorney's Office who will provide a prosecutor's perspective on the case and the trial. Those who attend the event will be eligible for MCLE credits. Information about this event will be placed either on the Above the Law column or on the YouTube description. If you're interested in attending, please visit the Westside Bar Association website where you can purchase a ticket. So Mark, please tell us a little bit about yourself, including when and where you went to law school. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin at Madison uh, in 1987. Okay. So almost 35 years ago. It'll be 35 years ago next month. Okay. How much was law school tuition back then? Do you remember? Yeah, I, unfortunately I do. Um, <laughs> my last semester was uh, $1,750 for tuition. Oh. You know, if you adjust for inflation, that still comes to about $6,000 per semester around there. Maybe not even that. It was a ridiculously good value. Yeah, I'll bet it was a good value. At the time you graduated, do you kind of remember what the starting salaries of attorneys were at that time? Well, when I graduated, um, I went to work for a mid-sized insurance defense firm in Milwaukee of about 50 lawyers. Yeah, that doesn't even exist anymore. And I was making 50 grand. Okay, so back then, um, if you lived fairly modestly at the time, you could probably pay off your loans fairly quickly if you really wanted to. Quite easily. And then, yeah, you know, I only did that for a year. And then I went to the Kenosha District Attorney's Office and I took a huge cut in pay working for the government. My first six months, I only made 26 grand. So, that gives you an idea of the difference. Okay, that's a fairly common career transition for young attorneys. So what made you go into criminal defense work? Uh, did you feel that it was your calling? Uh, I worked working for the insurance defense firm. I hated it. Um, I wanted to be in court. And they tell you you'll be in court and you'll get to try cases. But nobody at that firm ever tried cases. Everything was always settled out of court. And... Um, as a young associate, all you did was sit in the library and write, and that's not what my idea of being a lawyer was. So when you went to the DA's office, what division did they assign you to? What kind of cases were you working on? Well, and that was, you know, I had when I decided to leave the firm, I had two different offers, both in district attorney's offices in southeastern Wisconsin, and one was in the juvenile division was an offer, and then the other one was in Kenosha, and the Kenosha offer was a situation where they threw you into regular court and you do many felonies, misdemeanors, and drunk drivings. Um, and if you worked out on the many felonies, they'd give you big ones, you know, as quick as you proved yourself. And um, that appealed to me so I wouldn't be stuck doing, you know, traffic cases and things like that. And I think my fifth or sixth trial, um, which happened very quickly was an attempted murder. So things moved along very quickly in that office. You got a lot of responsibility as you earned it. Um, and that appealed to me. Okay. So how long on average did an attorney work at the office? Were there any lifers there? There's, there's a lot of lifers. It, it's funny that you should ask in that because the person who's the head of the office right now um, was hired either one or two people after I was hired back in 1988. And he's the one who ran the prosecution in Rittenhouse, was out of that office, one of my ex-co-workers. 
Okay, so you're not referring to Mr. Binger, who was the lead prosecutor in the case? No, I'm talking about the DA. Oh, um, the DA. Gravely. Oh, I see. Was he was he elected, or is it just kind yeah, of a... elected? Oh, okay, you got. You. Okay, so at some point, I mean, you worked there for a couple of years, and then looks like at some point you went out on your own. Uh, what, I, what I did two years in Kenosha, and then I did two mm -hmm. years in Racine, where my office is now, um, DA's office. So I did four years total as a prosecutor, and then you kind of decide whether or not you're going to be a lifer or you want to try something else. I always knew I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer. That's what appealed to me. Um, representing somebody who needed help. And I had read the books from criminal defense lawyers. There aren't many prosecutor books. And that's what I was interested in. And so I, back in 1991, I put out my shingle, my own op place with a uh, rent and office space from another lawyer and made a career out of it. Okay, that's how a lot of criminal defense attorneys get their career start. But have you ever thought about working for the public defender's office? No, I never did. Um, I think in theory, public defenders and public defenders' offices are a great idea. Um, but I think too often they become institutional and at least in Wisconsin, they are expected to do too much with too little. Um, if I have, you know, 30 open files in my office for me at any one time, that's a lot. There are felony public defenders in my county who have 200 cases open. And yeah. there's just no human way that they can do an adequate job of defending that many people at one time. You know, additionally, there's there there's the list, so to speak, where when I started out, I would take um, conflict cases from the public defender's office. Um, it pays a slave wage, but if you're just starting out in practice and you need to fill time, it can work. Um, and I did that for many years. And as my practice grew, obviously, I would do less and less of those. And at a certain point, probably 15 years ago, there was a new boss in the public defender's office in my home county. And she called me up and told me, uh, Mark, you have to do more cases. And I said to her, I go, I don't. You're not really my business partner or running my business I've always had an arrangement with your office where I'd take one or two homicide cases a year where the person hadn't confessed and I would do that case or cases. And she goes, well, we're not willing to do that anymore. You have to take more cases. And I said, no, she goes, we're going to kick you off the list. I go, go ahead. I don't care. Um, you know, who are you really hurting? So I, 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 I think the public defender's office is a great idea in theory, but in action, I don't think it, does the job it's supposed to do. Do prosecutors have a large caseload as well, or is it only just the public defenders? I, 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 think, pub, I think prosecutors have heavy workloads too, but you have to remember that a prosecutor isn't, doesn't have a client, doesn't have, you know, the investigation is already done when it comes to the prosecutor. I mean, there will be things a prosecutor will ask law enforcement to go out and do to follow up and things like that. But when the case comes to their desk, it's all in a nice package, a nice bundle, at least with the prosecution's theory supported. So it, to me, it's a much different job than being a criminal defense lawyer, having done both of them. Um, I know prosecutors don't like it when I say it, but it's shooting fish in a barrel. It's not that hard. Uh, you know, you can go to a you can go to a jury trial. You know what the police reports say. You're putting on mostly professional witnesses, and you have to remember the important question of what happened next. So you lived in Kenosha all or most of your life. I, I've lived in southeastern Wisconsin. Um, okay. You know, most of my life, I went away. My first year of law school, I went to Gonzaga in Spokane, Washington. Uh, my two summers of law school, I lived in Chicago. 
um, worked for firms in Chicago. Um, but I've lived in southeastern Wisconsin most of my life. Oh, uh, since you went to law school in Wisconsin, you didn't have to take the bar exam after you graduated, right? Correct. Still don't yeah. have to. Well, it's interesting because a couple of years ago, a couple of states were one to follow Wisconsin's example and abolish the bar exam. I think Utah tried it a couple of years ago. They imposed some sort of temporary diploma privilege. You no, know, Utah's talked about it. I have a house in Utah. And you have to take the bar in Utah. Okay. So, I mean, just kind of, I guess before the Jacob Blake shooting and, and the unrest, I mean, nobody knew where Kenosha was. So can, can you just kind of tell us like what the demographic was like, what, the, what life is like in Kenosha a little bit? Just kind of send the background for what happened. Kenosha is you know, right in the middle between Chicago, Illinois, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, it's off of uh, I-94. It was, um, used to be known for American Motors and Chrysler automobiles. There was a huge factory, um, which closed probably um, in the early 90s. And a lot of businesses went away like the Midwest Rust Belt. Um, it's now kind of become, it's on the last stop of the uh, commuter train to Chicago. So a lot of people live and commute down to Chicago. Um, it's, it's a nice city. There's, it's right on Lake Michigan, has great beaches, things to do outside, bike trails and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's had its share of crime um, going on. Uh, when we talked earlier, you mentioned that Kenosha had a freeway which divided the town. And on one side, it was a rural area where mostly conservatives lived. And on the other side, it was a urban area where mostly liberals live. What was that like? Yeah, it's um, the freeway goes right through the middle of the county. Um, and it's basically the city is east of the freeway, the city of Kenosha, urban, regular city, city problems. And then west of the freeway is rural. Um, and Kenosha is a very purple county, um, but it's red on the west side and blue on the east side. And when you average those out, it turns purple. But historically, the city is very Democratic and the rural part is very Republican. So the Jacob Blake matter, so the shooting happened in 2020, and if I remember correctly, after the investigation, the DA's office declined to prosecute the officer. Is that correct? What, in August? Yes, before the unrest happened in August. Right. It, it had, the Jacob Blake happened, um, I think, the 22nd, and the Rittenhouse shooting happened late on the evening of the 25th. So you weren't the original attorney that started with this case. I believe uh, Mr. Lynn Wood and John Pierce was first assigned to this case. Is that correct? Yeah, I was, I was hired um, in the middle of September by Lynn Wood and John Pierce at that time to be um, local counsel or second chair, depending on who you talk to. Okay, I see. So at some point while the trial progressed, you stepped up to become the lead attorney. Is that correct? Correct. It, it was, um, things had happened during um, preparation for the trial and um, the defense was kind of, it wasn't kind of, was um, funded by donations from people. And it got to the point where John Pierce was going to practice on my license, I was the local counsel, and a determination was made that either he had to do fundraising and he could be on television and say the things that he wanted to say, um, or he could be a member of the defense and practice law, but not be able to do all the extrajudicial statements. And at that point, he chose to uh, go with the fundraising um, and I kind of then stepped into the role of lead counsel. Um, and then a short time after that, um, there was a separation from even that. And John left the defense group and Lynn Wood went off and did the things he did with Donald Trump. 
so while you were prepping for trial and as the trial progressed, what kind of resources did you have? Um, you definitely had a jury consultant and also some experts as well. So with all of that being there, that must have been quite expensive for the defense team. Well, you know, <laughs> a case is pretty straightforward. I mean, you can usually read a criminal complaint, which is the bare bones facts of the case. And if you're not an idiot, you can figure out what your defense is going to be. Um, you know, in this case, before I had ever met Kyle, you knew the defense wasn't going to be, I didn't do it. Um, he's on video with an AR-15 shooting the gun and people are falling down. So it's not that hard to figure that out. Um, the evidence was going to be videographic. Um, you know, this case was, I can't begin to explain the level of video evidence in this case. At the second shooting scene, when Kyle uh, fired and shot um, and killed Huber and shot Gage Grosskutz in the arm, there was at least five different cameras rolling at that time. And each of those cameras uh, was from a different perspective. Um, two of them, th three of them were video and two of them were still cameras. And some of the still shots were just unbelievable in clarity and quality. Um, so it wasn't much to figure out what happened. It was to find the evidence that best supported the story that your client was going to tell in this case obviously kyle and that was one of the th it, it was always a question but always understood that he was going to testify um the first meeting i ever had with kyle rittenhouse when he was in custody in illinois was about whether or not he could win the case without testifying and i I probably, and I know a lot of criminal defense lawyers disagree with me, but I put on clients. Um, I've put on some cases where I put the client on the witness stand and people couldn't believe it. And I just think a Wisconsin jury wants to hear the defense and they want, if you're going to put on a defense, I think you need to put your client on. And we worked with Kyle and he testified and I think he did a good job. Okay. Uh, would you have put OJ Simpson on the stand? What's that? Would you have put O.J. Simpson on, on the stand? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't no. work with O.J., so I can't answer that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would have been interesting if he did go on the stand. Well, uh, just to go back on that subject, I just wanted to ask you whether there are any factors that you see that will be considered deal breakers to say, well, this not guy got to go on the stand. There's just something wrong about him. Are there any certain things that you look at that are ultimately deal breakers? Well, if, yeah. if you know the client can't handle it, mm -hmm. then you're just shooting yourself or your client in the head by putting them on. There's some people who aren't intellectually capable enough to take the witness stand and be cross-examined by a prosecutor. There are prosecutors who are terrible at cross-examining and you don't have to be that afraid of them. So you have to take all those facts into consideration. Um, you know, I, I did a federal jury trial probably 12, 15 years ago, and it was an armed postal robbery with a hostage. And it's too long and convoluted of a story. But in that case, I felt as though the defendant, even though he had three prior felony convictions, needed to tell these 12 people that he didn't do it. And we had a reasonable alternative for somebody who did. And part of the reason the strategy worked is we never let on that he was going to testify. And the prosecutors never prepared a cross-examination. So when we put him on first thing in the morning on day two of our defense case, the prosecution wasn't ready. They didn't have a good cross worked up and they couldn't stall long enough to get past lunch. It was over and he escaped unscathed and was acquitted. Um, 
so there's a lot of determinations to whether or not you put somebody on. Um, in Kyle's case, once we used the mock trial and figured out that he was a net positive in the mock juries, it just solidified our decision. And ultimately, he wanted to testify and tell his story. And I think, you know, the proof's in the pudding. I, I think everybody would agree he did a pretty good job. And I, I've spoke to jurors after of this case, and they thought he did a good job. So um, I think that's one of the reasons he was acquitted. The other reason he was acquitted was the video. Um, it wasn't just Kyle telling the story and left open to interpretation. We had video evidence to support the things he said. Okay, so basically what you're saying is that uh, there are a variety of factors that go into whether to put the defendant on the witness stand. My question to you is, is this an intuitive decision based on your gut? Or do you have like a little checklist that you go through to make that determination? Or am I full under pressure? It's a, it's a whole list of factors that in every case is different. Um, if, if your case is self-defense, and your client's state of mind is the issue, then it makes it highly likely it's going to put him on. You're going to need to put him on. If it's a case where everybody agrees what happens and the defendant's state of mind isn't an issue, then maybe you don't have to put him on. Um, does the person have, you know, 23 prior convictions that are going to come in against them? Then it's like, What's the point? The jury's not going to believe him no matter what he says. So there's a whole list of factors. In every case, they're different. You just kind of weigh them. We had the luxury of pre-testing our story, pre-testing our client's story um, in front of a jury. And we showed one of the mock jurors, um, I, I should say it this way, two mock jurors got to see Kyle testify and we used one as a control group that didn't see Kyle testify. And the movement towards acquittal or conviction was much greater when Kyle testified with the two panels than the one. So that just made our decision quite easy. Okay, so why don't we turn next to the law that's in question at this trial, which is the self-defense privilege. Um, I must admit I am not too familiar with this defense, uh, but it looks like it says that a person is allowed to use self-defense, but not excessively. And you're only allowed to use deadly force as self-defense if you have reasonable belief that someone's going to use deadly force on you. Is this correct? I, Wisconsin self-defense is an affirmative defense. So the defense has to produce evidence that if believed, would come within the self-defense um, defense. And was the defendants, are the defendants' beliefs reasonable? And then were his actions in response to those beliefs reasonable? So if somebody comes at you and says, I'm going to punch you and there's no weapon involved, you can't reach for a baseball bat and hit him in the head. Um, in our case, it was a situation where we had evidence that he was grabbing for the gun. And it was our position that the person, Rosenbaum, who was grabbing for the gun, was going to take Kyle's gun from him and use it against him. And that was based upon prior threats that Rosenbaum had made to Kyle and to other individuals who were with Kyle and were heard and were reported to law enforcement. Um, the FBI when they were all interviewed separately after the events. Um, so we was, was it reasonable for Kyle to shoot him four times? That was ultimately the question of count number one, which to us, and I think to the jury was the hardest count for acquittal. Um, so everybody was all up in arms because they said that Kyle brought the gun there. So if the guy's trying to take his gun, it's Kyle's fault. That was one position. The other part is what Kyle was doing, possessing that gun, and it was subject to litigation, was legal in the state of Wisconsin on August 25th. 
because he was a 17 year old, the gun was of a legal length and size. So he was doing nothing wrong. And Mr. Rosenbaum didn't have the lawful authority or reason to try to attack Kyle and Kyle defended himself. People got upset about that, but that's the law in the state of Wisconsin. Okay, so let's just say I was there at the scene at the riot, and then someone like Mr. Rosenbaum was coming at me, um, him and his two aggressors, but I don't know what they're holding. They could be holding a gun, or they could be holding nothing at all. But so long as I subjectively, but had good faith reason to believe that they were about to kill me, do I have that defense? Do I have yes, that with that? Okay, so I think one of the issues in the case and during the closing arguments, what you and the prosecutor disagreed on, was the use of that skateboard. And what I believe Mr. Binger was arguing during his closing was that the skateboard is capable of creating a great deal of bodily harm or even death, as opposed to where you were saying otherwise. That's ridiculous. And, and I'm not, and I know you're quoting Mr. Binger, but if one Googles skateboard deaths, just simply on Google or crimes committed with a skateboard in South Southern California, there are numerous right. murders and attempted murders with skateboards. So it's quite easy for a skateboard to cause at a minimum great bodily harm, if not death. And one doesn't have to wait around and take multiple whacks to the head to find out if he's going to be successful. And in the video of Huber striking my client for the second time is also Mr. Huber grabbing the gun and trying to take it away from Kyle. You know, the government didn't want to concede that and fought like hell to say that didn't happen. But when you look at the slowdown video, his hand goes right for the gun and you can see it being pulled away from Kyle until Kyle fires the one shot that goes in his chest. So I, I don't think that the argument of, oh, a skateboard isn't going to cause more so great bodily harm than death, was, it wasn't taken serious by the jury. Um, and, you know, and just as an aside, why do you think the government did nothing? And I stress the word nothing to try and achieve, not achieve, retrieve that skateboard from Huber's girlfriend because they know how big it was, they know how heavy it was, and they didn't want the jury to see it, to feel it, and know how big it was. So that, that, that was, they hurt themselves making what I would consider a very weak argument. Well, I used to skateboard when I was young, uh, many years ago, more years than I care to admit. Uh, but I do know that skateboards tend to come in all shapes and sizes. Did you get a chance to see the skateboard up close? So This was a big skateboard. We have video of it. Okay, did you actually see the skateboard? We, we have video. You see it in the video. You see him striking him with it. The skateboard was at least two feet long with the trucks on each end. Right. So an argument could be made that using the trucks can show the intent. Uh, for those who don't know, the trucks are the metal portions of the skateboard. Yeah, well, if you hit them with the trucks hard enough, you'll knock them out. If you hit them enough times, you'll eventually kill them. Of course, based on that video, we can't really tell what the intent was in that case. You might think that he had intent. That's what was he hitting him up. for? I'm sorry? What was he hitting him for? I don't know. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I mean, you, you know, now, and, and I understand you're just asking questions, but it's, you know, and that was, that was why when Binger made the arguments regarding Rosenbaum, you know, it, why was he going after Kyle Rittenhouse that, you know, we don't have to prove anything. The state has to disprove it. So the reality is you tell me why Mr. Huber, who was not involved, was not even at the first incident, chases him down. And this is all on video strikes him as he's running down the street with the skateboard. Kyle blocks it with his arm, and then he's knocked to the ground by a different gentleman, using that term in the broadest sense, and in comes Hubert to strike him with the skateboard to his head and neck area. You know, I mean, he wasn't there to, you know, help him. I mean, 
we can, and I understand as lawyers, we do it all the time. We ask the theoretical questions. Um, what if, what this, what that, but one has to remember in this case, there was video of what Mr. Huber did. He chased the client, my client, Kyle Rittenhouse, for a block and a half, striking him with the skateboard on two separate occasions, one to the head and neck area, and was trying to take his firearm when he was shot in the chest. Okay, so let's talk about the videos for a second. I did get a chance to see the latest videos, and some of them look very grainy, so it was kind of hard to tell. So how were you able to tell who was who in some of the more obscure videos, um, particularly the ones with the aerial shots? The, the, air, the aerial photos were... Or the aerial videos, sorry. The, the, there were two aerial videos. One was done by the federal government. They had a fixed-wing aircraft above. And then the other one was a fixed drone. And the infrared fixed wing aircraft was filmed from 2,000 feet in the air. Um, that was a subject of a lot of uh, discovery and fighting over. But it, the way you could tell who was who in the infrared was going backwards. So you went from the point of the shots fired at the Rosenbaum thing. And then you kind of reversed slowly and you tracked all the dots and we marked the dots by different colors and things like that, which was very helpful because it showed them, Zeminski and Rosenbaum leaving where they were starting a fire right as they saw Kyle come. Rosenbaum hides between the vehicles and then jumps out when he's confronted by Zeminski. Then chases Kyle runs Kyle down into this area where the cars were, and that's where the shooting occurs. The fixed, the, the fixed drone video was the subject of the motions during trial, and that video was initially played, a portion of it was played on Tucker Carlson, and that was right after the shooting. Somebody released that to Tucker Carlson, and that video started right when Mr. Rosenbaum threw what was later determined to be a plastic hospital bag at our client and chased Kyle. It did not have the initial confrontation in it. And we knew about that video from being played on Tucker Carlson. We, through investigation, found out that the only person or entity um, in southeastern Wisconsin that had a permit to fly a fixed wing drone at night was this company out of Lake Geneva called Urban Air. And we tracked down the owner and we went to interview him with two detectives and he lied to us and denied it was his drone, denied that he had anything to do with it. And we felt as though he was lying, but we couldn't prove it. We did FOIA requests to try and pin it down. The federal government stonewalled us. So we felt as though we're going to be going to trial without this video. We could never authenticate it, never could get the beginning or the end. It was a very brief video of the thing on Tucker Carlson. On the first Friday of the jury trial, so day five, at the morning break, the prosecutor, Mr. Krause, came up to us and said, hey, guys, we were just dropped this video anonymously, we have a thumb drive for you. So we took the thumb drive and viewed it. And myself and co-counsel looked at us, looked at it, and it was from before the incident started, but it was the same video that had been shown on Tucker Carlson. It was just longer. And it looked to be about the same quality. And you couldn't see the shooting. You couldn't see the events leading up to it in any clarity. You knew where it happened and you could see a commotion. And the government wanted to put this in and we hemmed and hawed about it. and We agreed that they could introduce it. And then they wanted to do enhancements just using an iPhone, which is the touch and move. And we objected to that because that's using artificial intelligence. It can't be replicated and it doesn't mean 
that what they're showing on that video is actually there or actually happening. And the judge agreed with that. And then they had the Wisconsin Crime Lab do enhancements. And they then, based upon that video, sought a provocation instruction, which can be used to negate somebody's right to self-defense. And so on the Friday of the jury instruction conference, the judge goes, I want to see this video. And the defense had purchased a four or 8K television, I can't even remember which, so that we would have clarity with it. And we're showing the judge this video. And he's watching it numerous times over and over and over. And he goes, I can't see anything. And Binger comes around the table and starts watching it. And he looks at Kraus and he says, because we're all right there, he goes, whose video is this? And Binger's, and Kraus says, it's the defense video. And he goes, get the good one, ours. And I go, what? And this is, you know, an informal jury instruction conference, but that's when we became aware that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And based upon that, we filed a motion at first for mistrial without prejudice and then later mistrial with prejudice because we received information that it had been compressed by, by a proprietary um, program that just happened to be on Jim Krause's laptop, which was shown during closing arguments when they switched videos, his laptop screen with all the icons was there. And there was the compression program that had, uh, and I'm not real good at this stuff, but when they compressed it, it compresses to a proprietary dimension. And so certain amounts of pixels and a very strange um, width and depth combination. And so we knew it had been done by that program, which just happened to be on the prosecutor's computer. The judge took it under advisement and said, I'm not going to rule, but you've clearly made a prima facie showing. And if there is a verdict on count one or count two of guilty before that verdict is going to be entered, we're going to have a hearing on this. Um, we gave our closing arguments. The manipulations that the Wisconsin Crime Lab did were a big part of that um, because we believe they had doctored a photo. And that's what our experts said. And it had... It had what looked like a firearm in Kyle's arm pointing in Zeminski's direction, but it had a left-handed stance as opposed to a right-handed stance, which if anybody knows anything about guns, you're not going to do that. You're, you don't unnaturally hoist the gun and put it up into your left shoulder if you're right-handed. So uh, that was subject of a lot of litigation. Uh, the jury heard all of it. We argued it in closing arguments. And after four days, the jury came back not guilty on all counts. Okay, so just real quick, let's turn back to that video. Uh, you mentioned that you had an issue with the pinch and zoom feature of that video. I just wanted to point out something amusing that I noticed during that exchange. Uh, you and the other attorney were mentioning, uh, you mentioned the word al logarithm. I think you meant the word algorithm. It, it was definitely, an, it's an algorithm. Yeah, I think, I think okay. you, know, you, you said logarithm. I just, okay. It just made me smile. It's okay. But um, you're under the hey, impression. I told you I wasn't that good at this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. I just, I just hear the word so many times. Logarithms, like it's something I haven't heard since like high school, high school math. So a lot of people are saying is, and I tend to agree with them, is that the pinch and zoom feature actually makes the picture itself bigger. But because it's a, on a computer screen, the picture looks grainy and a little blurry. But you're claiming that the pinch and zoom feature, if used, it actually alters the photo itself. Is that correct? It does. It takes, it creates information. See, so like the drone is looking at the, if the drone is here, my fist, and this is the crime scene, my open hand. If the drone is right here, it doesn't have the information that is here, okay? So if you go to the top of it and go like this, it's the artificial intelligence is filling in what it thinks is here. And that's adding definition, it's adding color, it's adding pixels that don't exist. 
And once that happens, all bets are off. The program that the government did end up using, besides the one that was in your eye, in their iPhone, is a program that specifically said on their own website, this is not to be used for forensic purposes, the program. It is only to be used for investigatory purposes. And that's because it's not, it, just because the picture shows that doesn't mean that's what the picture should have been or was. Okay, I think the distinction there is that when you use the pinch and zoom feature, the computer sometimes adds in colors in order correctly or incorrectly to enhance the picture. But it's a completely different situation when you use the pinch and zoom feature and the computer in the process adds a gun in there or puts two additional people in there, which we all know doesn't really happen. But it, it did, in this case, it, it did put a gun in there. The gun wasn't raised. And what ends up happening is it takes an anomaly, anomaly from the photo, which happened to be the shine from a light onto a mirror and the mirror um, housing and turned it into what could argued be argued was a firearm. And then even after Kyle supposedly drops the gun, that anomaly or anomaly is still there. So he's dropping it, but the gun is still there, which makes no sense. So, I mean, video, videographic evidence is so incredibly powerful but it is so subject to being misused. Um, and I would be real honest, I was not at all versed and still have a huge amount to learn um, for the way these things can happen in cases. But it's the more and more examples of this are coming out. Um, we were just speaking at a, um, conference myself, Corey, and Dr. Black, and they were talking about one of the examples they had in a case that they used where it happened with body camera footage, enhanced body camera footage. So it's it's very, I don't want to say common, but once you start manipulating, changing the perspective, changing the point of view, you're adding and changing that photo artificially. Okay, got it. Well, I don't want to spend much more time on this. I'm sure you'll talk about this in much more detail at the Waldorf Astoria. Otherwise, the organizer is going to kill me for giving too much away. But you've been talking a lot about pinch and zoom and drones and uh, smartphone video cameras. And it's pretty much everywhere these days. So as a criminal defense attorney, do you feel like you have to have at least a familiarity? Or do you have to have a certain level of proficiency in order to best represent your clients in criminal defense cases? I, you know, I, if if I look at something and I the, the examples that I've seen and, and used sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully are cleaning up a tape to get some of the uh, um, interference and things like that to try and get a clean copy of either a wire or a Title III wire intercept of someone's phone calls. Um, the In our case with Rittenhouse, there was a video, and in a presentation I show this, where you see Kyle's shadow, because it's dark, running down the street, but you can't really make it out. And he's being chased. And Kyle says, this is where Huber struck me with the skateboard the first time and you can hear something on it, but you don't know what it is. And the skateboard goes flying, which you can see. Um, we hired John black to enhance that video. He did not change the pictures, pixels, the color or the clarity. All he did was move the contrast and the brightness in two different ways. And he does it for the jury right in front of him to show up how easy this is. And then you could see Kyle, you could see Huber chase him, and you could see Huber strike him with the skateboard the first time. So did we use that? Yes, we did. But it never changed the point of view. It never added anything nor subtracted anything from that video. And our expert was able to testify to that. 
Whereas when the state's expert testified under oath and was asked those same questions, he could not answer those questions. I think it's still safe to say that the nation is still deeply polarized. I mean, this the events occurred before the election and the trial took place not so long after the election and its aftermath. And even uh, former President Trump and President Biden had something to say about it. So on that note, um, have you or the previous defense members considered or maybe even been pressured to use political ideology as some kind of defense in this case? Yeah. Um, that was predecessor counsel wanted to argue um, that there had been a general breakdown of civil order in Kenosha. And because of that, under federal law, Kyle was a member of an unregulated militia and his actions were privileged. Um, that was not a good defense. Um, and it, we had a defense that was recognized under law in Wisconsin, self-defense. So why would we go trudging off into left field, hoping and praying um, that this judge would give us some bizarre instruction. So, it, you know, we never tried to make the case political. We wanted to keep the politics of the case as much as possible out of the case. The judge was very much of that same mindset. I'm not going to sit here and tell you or tell anybody, attempt to, that politics does not enter into a case like this. Um, that's picking the jury, being aware of that. Um, and you are sending certain messages in your opening, your closing, you know, that certain words have certain meanings to different people. Um, I think that that was done on both sides. And Ultimately, the jury decides based upon their calculation, which we don't know what that is, but we have ideas. Yes, and I think that you and Mr. Binger, to both of your credits, uh, did your best to keep politics out of it. Um, I think the worst of it was when the judge mentioned something about it during jury, jury instructions. He mentioned, um, don't pay attention to social media or what the current president of the United States said or what the president before him said. Um, how helpful do you think this was when for the jury? Yeah, I, and I, I think that was helpful. I mean, we we felt strongly if the jury decided the case based upon the evidence that was produced in court, we were going to win. And so I, you know, um, in selecting the juries, the jurors, um, there was, we believe, a juror who wanted to be on the panel. And we believe she did not wish to be on the panel to be a good juror. Um, we had seen her Facebook posts and we saw those and we questioned her on those. And she had taken them down before she was in panel. And we found that very suspicious. And, you know, we struck her. And so the politics entered into it. There's no two ways about it. But nobody made an overt political reference or charge to the jury. And I think if they had, the judge would have went nuts. Oh, of course, the juror that's motivated to be on this case for whatever reason is not going to say anything that's going to get them disqualified by saying that I'm a racist or I believe in Antifa or I'm a Democrat or Republican. They're going to say whatever it is that's going to get them on the jury. So with that being said, I mean, what kind of qualities were you looking for as an ideal juror for the defense? Well. We were looking for an older conservative um, juror, anybody. We wanted people who felt as though things had gotten away from Kenosha. Um, and what I mean by that, that possibly the police didn't do what they were supposed to. The fire department didn't do what they were supposed to. That second night of unrest when everything burned. Um, and then Kyle was there and people like Kyle were there protecting properties. They had been called vigilantes, but the police weren't out patrolling. And 
we wanted people who thought that law and order had broken down and that somebody needed to do something. Um, I, they would technically be Republicans. Um, we were very aware of political affiliation. We were very aware of what groups people belong to, um, what their postings were on Facebook, whether they were pro Black Lives Matter or um, pro uh, law enforcement. Uh, there were certain websites in Kenosha that many people went to who were conservative that we were aware of. And we had people's web history, and potential jurors. So we looked for the exact opposite juror that we would usually want as a criminal defense lawyer. We wanted a law and order, more conservative, more rural jury than we would usually um, seek as defense lawyers. And I think that was one of the biggest mistakes that the prosecution in this case made. They picked the same jurors that they historically pick. And this wasn't a case of that. So we were both striking the same types of people, younger, liberal, um, more urban. And I think that helped us meeting the defense. Okay, well, that strategy definitely worked for you. And now I want to talk about your closing statements, well, both you and the prosecutor. Uh, it looks like the two of you gave very long but very structured speeches throughout the closing statements. Um, you first started out with a summary of what happened. And then each of you uh, broke it down and discussed every element of the charges. And then you seemed to all tie together at the very end. Uh, but maybe you didn't notice at the time, but each of your closing statements ran pretty long, about maybe two hours. So the issue there is, like, how do you keep the jury's attention during this whole time? We didn't keep their attention. We bored the hell out of them and they wanted to deliberate. Um, mine was two hours and four minutes long. Yeah. The state's was over three hours. I believe it was three hours and 20 minutes. Yeah, I, I didn't see all I, I, I Not that I was keeping track. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, think about that. We're, we start first thing in the morning. The jury's instructed. Binger then talks for two hours and take a short recess. I talk for two more hours. And then Jim Krause talked for over an hour. And he, you could tell that the jury just wanted this done with. And, yeah. you know, they had their minds made up. We didn't know how they had them made up. But, you know, we as lawyers want to think what we have to say is so important. Um, what we have to say in our opening, I believe, is 100 times more important than what we have to say in our closings. By closing, especially in a two-week jury trial, the jurors have a general sense of what happened. They know what they want to do, and we're not going to change too many minds. Um, I didn't honestly believe I was going to talk two hours. I had kind of worked through my closing, and it came in right about an hour and 35, hour and 40 minutes. Um, and it ended up, we added a couple of things during my closing because of things they had said in their closing. And I only have one opportunity to speak. So, you know, it is what it is. I, I talked to the jurors after and they, they said, um, why did you guys talk so long? So <laughs> I, I mean, you know, because we're lawyers and we think we have to. How's that for an answer? <laughs> well, we lawyers are led to believe that everything we say during closing statements is so important that the jury has to not only hear it, but they have to remember it. But after 30 minutes of hearing all of this, and but these days with social media and all, our attention span has been reduced even shorter to a few minutes. So with that being said, it's just kind of really hard these days to keep and maintain a jury's attention span. So what people have to rely on are zingers, that one-liners are zingers that people need to remember. And I don't know if you guys really had that, did you? That kind of, that, ah, that focus, line. focus, out of focus. Oh, that's right. I, oh, I, I can't focus, believe you focus. didn't remember. No, I saw, oh, I, no, no, I do, I didn't, I should have, I should have brought that up. Okay, focus, focus, there was no focus. Okay, I do remember that line, I forgot. Okay, but you had that zinger there, that's good to have a one-liner, but still, and I mentioned closing statements because that is what the jury hears last before they start deliberating. 
So you, I, I, you, and this is, yeah. I'm not trying to justify what I said or didn't say, but this is the mindset. And I think, and I think it's a valid mindset. As a criminal defense lawyer, you have a client who is on trial for his life. If we win, he goes home. Mm-hmm. If we lose, he goes to prison where he will die. Yeah. And if you put it in that stark of terms, and in this trial, it was that stark, um, I can justify talking for two hours. And, yeah. you, you know, I could have got up there and said, okay, ladies and gentlemen, you have your mind made up. Good luck. Go do it. And yeah. if I win, that's great. If I lose, I'm going to answer for that for the rest of my life. Yeah. And you can't do that. I mean, if I had an associate who wanted to pull something like that, I'd kill him or her, you know? Yeah. So it, it, on the outside chance that one of those jurors is sitting on the fence and you can give them one little kernel of truth that might make them fall your way, you got to try. Oh, no, definitely. I agree with you that you should try. But I think, well, let me just put it this way. When you were giving your closing statement, were you keeping an eye on the jury to make sure that they weren't bored or sleepy? I knew they were bored and I knew they were sleepy because I was bored and I was sleepy. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, you know it. When And after two weeks of jury trial, um, you're exhausted. And all, you know, I asked to have a tighter limit. I wanted an hour and a half for both sides, you know, and let's make this focused and to the point. And the judge was like, you know, I don't want to do that. Um, it's such a big case. It's so important. You know, and he kind of said the outer limits three hours and they even went over that. Um, so I tried, um, I lost and that was probably the least important thing I lost. So, you know, such is life. Well, you gave a very effective closing statement and as a result, you got a defense verdict. But uh, now that this case is over, is there any lessons that you learned from this case that particularly stands out in your mind? I mean, it's never as easy as you think it's going to be. Um, and, and I never think a case is going to be easy, but I think I, I, we were prepared. We thought we were ready. And we were prepared and ready, but there's always surprises. And I think good trial lawyers can deal with those surprises and not let them knock you completely off track. That's important. Um, I think in this case, not dealing with the media, and I don't mean that as a negative towards the media, but I did not speak to the media before the verdict. Um, We tried the case in the courtroom and I think that cut down on a lot of distractions um, and it kept us focused. I wasn't running out of the courtroom every day after court and talking to the media. I didn't think it was appropriate. Um, we would deal with it at a later date, one way or the other, positive or negative. Um, and it was hard. Um, the, the, having a co-counsel like Corey, um, who I've worked with on a lot of different cases over the years, um, was a pleasure. Um, you know, he's a great lawyer and he took certain hard jobs, did them. And, you know, we had a good time that way. And it's easier trying a case with a friend, somebody you trust. So that, you know, I, when the family talked about me becoming the lead counsel and being in charge of this whole thing, um, I said I would do it, but I had to have co-counsel. And I said, I can't tell you, you have to hire Corey, but I'd like you to at least meet with him and discuss the case with him and see if you're comfortable with him, because I'd much rather um, work with somebody I know and I trust. And there were other lawyers during the dependency of the case who tried to insert themselves into the case and become members of the defense. And they didn't have Kyle's best interests at heart. They wanted the media coverage. They wanted um, the kind of fame or the notoriety that was going to come from this case by just having their mush on television. And I really wasn't interested in having somebody like that on the team. Um, And that's, 
that was done from years of experience and knowing that any attorney who thinks he can control the media is an idiot. Um, so you just don't try and control them. You don't deal with them and you just work through what you have to work through. And at the end, if it all works out, okay, you'll be fine. Well, you may recall a particular incident involving the media toward the end of the trial. It was when the jurors were put into their bus where they were being taken home or to wherever. And at one point, a car was following them. And when the police pulled him over and started questioning him, he eventually confessed that he was being ordered by a media agency to follow the bus. Uh, what is your thoughts on this? Well, I thought whoever did it was a real idiot. Um, and... You know, that's that tension between you got to get the story and you got to kind of follow decorum and security. And, you know, the security and trying to keep those jurors anonymous yeah. during the trial was so important. Um, I mean, I've never been a part of that where we were brought in um, through a secure entrance as defense lawyers. And that way we weren't going to be subjected to any of the people outside the protesters. We were searched every day by, you know, a dog and a metal detector. And I was fine with that. The jurors came in the exact same way we did and left the same way we did, which sometimes caused scheduling issues. If we didn't get out of the building right after court at night, we'd have to wait about a half hour until the jurors were gone. Um, but that, that's a small thing. But to, I just think for a media, the media to try and chase down and get their license plates off of their cars where they were parking, I don't think that was a real piece of good judgment. Um, I agree that this is a definite um, lapse in judgment here. I mean, as a juror, it'd be kind of concerning to know that my in a high profile case that my name and how I voted would possibly be compromised and released to the public. I mean, look at the consequences there. Somebody from one of the networks somehow, and I don't know how this happened, did get all the jurors' names. Oh. And because the night of the verdict, every juror received a gift basket from one of the big networks. And I'm not going to say which one. Yeah. Um, but I was told that by the three jurors I talked to after the verdict. And the jurors, um, you know, all said the same story. So somehow it happened. Um, I don't know how that did. You know, maybe somebody followed the van and didn't get caught. Um, but, you know, those, I know the jurors wanted to be anonymous. Um, I, I am amazed to this point that the jurors have not spoke to the media. I mean, if you look at all the big cases over the last 10 years or so, I think every single one of them has had jurors break ranks and talk. Um, some have said smart things. Some have said stupid things, but at least somebody's talked in this panel. As far as I know to this point, and I'm sure I would have heard, um, nobody has talked to the media. Well, just one more question about the jury and jury selection procedure here. Uh, when you're picking a jury, when you're speaking to the jury members, did any of them express concerns that their decision could possibly cause a riot? I would say it was alluded to. Um, yeah. You know, and the judge kind of, like all judges do, you'll put that out of your mind, won't you? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, and of course, it's a leading question and 99% of the jurors go, uh, yep, that's what we'll do. And that's it. It's solved. The problem is solved. Um, and I'm being facetious when I say that. But that, that's what happens. And um, we, we took that consideration, I think, that concern into consideration as we picked the jurors. Um, but there's only so much you can do about it. Uh, did the jurors know that their decision was going to be published all across the nation, and if not the world, or were they just sequestered? This jury did. So they knew the decision was going to have some sort of and ripple they, effect. To the point where when they were deliberating, probably the second or third day of deliberate, second day of deliberations, the protesters had grown very, uh, grown in numbers outside. Um, there were both sides protesting and they were very loud. And 
where the judge's deliberation room on the third floor is above his courtroom is right on the courthouse square. And that's where all the protesters were. And you could hear people chanting, convict Kyle Rittenhouse. You could, you know, hear that was one chant that was very clear. Um, there were other chants that were free Kyle Rittenhouse. I mean, so it was all there. And it got to the point where the judge said, should I send them a note? And we all kind of agreed, yes. You guys want to be moved to a room where you won't be subjected to hearing that. And the jury said, we hear it, but it's not going to affect us. We're fine where we're at. They just, that's what they said. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But they, they were, they never argued. They never had raised voices. And I've heard juries in, in state and federal court where you're, if you're in the courtroom, you're called in for a question or something. And while you're answering the question, you can hear through the doors yelling. Um, you usually can't make it out, but you can hear it. And this jury had none of that. Um, they, they were very, um, let everybody talk. At one point, they, my understanding is they used the talking stick concept. Whoever had the stick got to talk. There was no talking over people. They, they ran a very orderly and well-organized deliberation and they ended up you know, coming down with the verdicts the way they did. Were any of the jury members prominent members of the community or were all of them just regular people? They, they were regular people. Um, I, think, I think both sides would have been real leery if there was, you know, somebody who was a prominent member of the community. There were, there were working class people. There were people with advanced degrees. Um, there was, it was a very diverse educationally and professional jury um you know it was it was not racially diverse i think there was one um hispanic minority on the panel um and I'm, i can't remember if he got struck as an alternate or not but otherwise i think the jury was white it was it was really pretty much right down the middle half men half women yeah, you mentioned diversity a little while ago, and I'd like to touch on that subject for a little bit on, on this particular case. And well, the people probably saw this trial or parts of it or the sound bites. They saw the verdict and then thinking, OK, this Rittenhouse kid was white. He got off because of white privilege. If something like that were happening to me and if I got charged, I would have probably gone to jail just for life, just on a gun charge alone. So the justice system doesn't work for me. I mean, what do you say to some someone who says something like that? without sounding too cynical or too jaded or too stupid um, in criminal defense, money matters. Um, anybody who says it doesn't is stupid. Um, going back to where this interview started about public defenders. If I can devote six or eight weeks of my law practice full time to one case, um, that person is going to have a much better defense if I'm spreading myself out over a hundred different cases. So that's the first issue. Um, and money makes a difference. To me, this case isn't about white or black. If I had a black defendant sitting in front of me or next to me at this trial and the facts were the same, I believe he would have been acquitted. Um, but that's if the defense funds were the same and, you know, if they're paying Corey and I to represent him, we have the money to hire the experts. There's another case in Kenosha County that's gotten a huge amount of press. I think it's very interested, uh, interesting. It's also crowdfunded and she's the African-American female who killed arguably her pimp. Crystal Kaiser case is up in the Wisconsin Supreme Court right now on uh, some pretrial motions that the court's gotten involved in, but that's being funded um, by private donations and foundations. Um, she's an African American. I think it'll be very interesting to see how that happens. But in that case, if she wins, and I think she has a very good chance of prevailing, um, 
the most important thing is going to be the fact that people stepped forward and paid substantial amounts of money to get her into a defendable position. You know, how many cases go pre-trial to the Wisconsin Supreme Court? Not many. Uh, yes, money does play a big role in a criminal defense case. So I'd like to see if you can think about the situation. Let's just say that the trial happened a couple of years ago um, before Trump was elected and got the, didn't get the national attention that it did. Uh, you did have some adequate funding for this case, but nowhere near what you got for this particular trial. Is there anything, any expenses that you would have cut back on without cus- compromising the case? Well, <laughs> Yeah, I could say I could say now that I mean we had we had a forensic pathologist um, on retainer who we were flying in to testify for the defense case. Once their forensic pathologist, Dr. Kelly, testified, it went as good as we could have ever imagined. And trying to keep the jury, you know, his attention. Why should we put on another doctor for the defense who's going to say the exact same thing? So we cut him. Um, You know, there was another doctor, not doctor, but a ballistics expert that we engaged and we paid him money and he ended up not coming through. And when I mean not coming through, we had to have our opinions filed by a certain date and he never produced an admissible opinion. And so that was all wasted money. Um, hindsight being what it is, I would love to not have hired him. Um, but can't take it back. Um, right. So if we had, we spent huge amounts of money on investigation. Every name in every police report was tracked down and talked to if they would talk to us. Um, I flew out to New York City to meet with a witness and his lawyer um, with my investigator, that was a great cost. It was invaluable towards the defense. So I would, I would have a hard time saying where I would cut because I don't think it was an extravagant defense under the facts, but it cost a lot of money. I mean, would you say you spend a substantial amount of money on, on video equipment or just like video forensics? I mean, that's kind of the main issue, one of the main issues here. We get, you know, we got video um, open source off from online. We had people send it to us unsolicited. We solicited it from certain people um, that we knew were out there and had it because they had posted it. Um, so that was that was one of those trying to get as much as possible because you don't know what's going to be the one that kind of brings it all together, so to speak. Um, and then it was just a time, the amount of time to watch it and to kind of put the pieces together because there are all these disparate sources. Um, that was hard. Uh, and that took a lot of time, but it had to be done for a successful defense. We knew everything that Kyle did that night, except maybe four minutes that wasn't on film. <laughs> you got it down to the minutes. Okay, gotcha. We, we did. And yeah, no, I'm sure we had, our, we had our video expert. Um, the judge ended up not letting us use a lot of it, but we had his whole night tracked. You know, we could put him wherever he was through the, the video. And we also down, we, they took his phone when he was, when he turned himself in and it was a brand new iPhone. So they couldn't crack the phone. Um, they sent it to the FBI, Quantico and Quantico couldn't get into it. And we made a determination that we wanted what was in that phone. We thought it was more helpful to us than it would be to the state. So we negotiated um, the opening of that phone with us being present and our expert being present. So that way we had Kyle tracked throughout the night on his Google iPhone. And there wasn't anything that uh, ended up really hurt is hurting us in that phone. Whenever you're going to turn over a client's phone um, to the government, you're definitely afraid of what's going to be in there. Um, And routinely, I wouldn't do it. 
but in this case, it ended up making Kyle look a hell of a lot better than uh, um, Gage Grosquitz, who wouldn't let the government into his phone. Oh. You know, and that, they had a search warrant, and he fought him. And <laughs> so he has to get on the witness stand, and you know, you didn't give him your phone. You wouldn't let him look in your phone. No, I mean, he came across as a total jerk. And he had lied to the police already about having a gun. He told him he dropped the gun before he confronted Kyle. That was in his sworn statement. And then here he is on video pointing it right at Kyle's head. So, you know, it damaged him greatly before he even took the witness stand. So there were there were a lot of those quick decisions that were made, some quicker than others. Um, but if you had to ask what I would cut, oh, boy, you know, I can't think of anything that I could say, boy, we really blew it by doing this. There were some yeah. things um, we probably just, in a case like this, you do what you think you have to do and you worry about getting the experts and yourself paid later. And I think most experts understand that sometimes they're going to come up a little short on payment. Um, as I understand, sometimes as a criminal defense lawyer, I don't always get what I bargain for. And you just hope that you have enough funds that you don't end up having to shut your law firm down because you can't pay the bills. Okay, so that brings us to our next subject. Um, when, I guess you've been practicing for many years, when did you sort of know that you didn't have to worry about bills anymore? Or <laughs> <laughs> I worry about them every day. Yeah. <laughs> We, I always joke with my partner whenever I get retained on a case that we'll be able to keep the lights on for another week. And it really isn't that way. Um, it was maybe when I started out. Um, I always I was taught by the person who I first rented office space from, make sure that you always have money to pay your taxes. Um, yeah, seriously. And okay, no, you I, know, I can't disagree with you. I agree. You don't want the government to get in your business. Yeah. And if you have money in your business account, you will make better choices than if you don't have money in your business account. Yeah. I think some of the best fees I've ever quoted are fees I did not get. You know, you quote somebody a number because that's what the case is worth and they don't come up with the money and you see somebody who took the case for lower money and they end up hating the client, doing a shitty job, pardon my French, because they're not um, paid well or enough. And, you know, as I've gotten older, sometimes I'll quote a number and the person, oh, this, that, or the other. And it's like, no, it's not negotiable. That's what I charge. And when you get to a point after maybe 25 or 30 years for 20 years of doing good work, you can do that. And it makes your life a heck of a lot easier than when you're a young lawyer just starting out and nobody knows of you and they just want to hire a lawyer and they want the person to do it for the cheapest price. You don't want to be that lawyer. Yeah, I definitely agree. I definitely agree with that. So, I mean, did your practice dramatically pick up at one point or did it just slowly, slowly start to grow? Yeah, I mean, and I say, I say this and people get kind of, uh, I never made less money in private practice than I did when I worked for the district attorney's office. So the first two months I was in private practice, there were enough lawyers who knew I left the DA's office who threw me crumbs, referrals, that I was able to keep it together and make a living, not a great living, but every month you do it, it gets easier. You know, back in the old days, when I started out, it was yellow page commercial ads. So your first year, you didn't have anything in the yellow pages. So nobody knew how to get a hold of you. There wasn't the internet. And it was yellow pages and referrals. And now today, um, the yellow pages are gone. It's your internet presence, which you pay a lot of money for. But more importantly, referrals from other lawyers who don't do criminal law, right. um, who have clients who get in trouble. To me, those are the best cases. You're coming with a stamp of approval from somebody they trust. And usually the other lawyer isn't sending you somebody um, who they know can't pay. 
So right. Right, there's almost like a pre screen on the part of your friend who sent it to you. Um, so I think referrals are um, the best way to build a practice, but you can't get referrals until you get a reputation usually. Okay. I mean, for, for you, how long did, did that take? Well, you know, I got referrals from people I knew who I had been against as a prosecutor right away. There was a, the guy who was considered the Dean of uh, the Southeastern Wisconsin bar. His name was Marty Hansen. He's long since passed, but his associate was a guy by the name of Mike Fitzgerald, who was a very good friend of mine. Um, he was a year ahead of me in law school and we hung out together. And so when I went, left the prosecutor's office, him and Marty referred me in business. And it was back then, you know, cases that they would take, you know, for five or $10,000 for a felony, I would take for 2000. And I had no overhead. I could make money. I didn't have a secretary at that point. Um, and you worked and you tried to build up a reputation by doing those cases. You would look at a case back then, something I don't do now. Um, and I would say, this is a super defendable case. I'd like to do take this case because I can maybe go to jury trial, get an acquittal and build my reputation that way. Um, my first six jury trials as a defense lawyer, I won them all. And some of those were felonies, some were misdemeanors, but that helped. People got to hear about you in the courthouse and knew what you were doing and you were doing good work. Um, and then you, you know, you lose some, but you keep doing good work and it builds from there. And it's, there's no set way you're going to do it. Um, it's much harder, I think, today to build a reputation because so, so, so few cases now go to trial because the stakes are so high. Back then on a first degree murder case, if you lost, your client was eligible for parole in 13 years, four months by law. You know, so nobody ever pled to a first degree murder case because that's all you could get. Well, then the legislature changed it around and it was like 13 years, four was the minimum. And the judge could set your parole eligibility. Got to the point where now it's 20. Um, if there's a gun, it's 25. And the judge can set it 60 or never. So now there could be negotiations. Uh, most people don't negotiate on homicide cases, first degree homicide. Because who wants to sign up for a 30-year bit? Not too many people. Um, yeah, you can collect your Social Security when you reach parole. So it's it's harder to get as many trials. And my first um, four years as a prosecutor, four, first four years of practice, I had like 80 jury trials. You know, now nobody does that anymore. And it was rather common. As a defense lawyer and prosecutor, I've had over 120, 125. Um, you do them. And it's invaluable experience. You you can't learn how to try a case without trying a case. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. So, do you plan to write a book about this at some point? You know, people have talked to me about writing a book, and <laughs> I, I, if if I could write well, I'd probably do it. I'm not that I that if I had to say in my legal practice, my weakness, I pay people to write for me. I understand the concepts, the motions. I hate writing. Um, so yeah, if you know a good ghostwriter, send them my way. I've got some great stories, but I, I, I don't know that I'm going to be writing a book. <laughs> what happened behind the scenes and the decisions that were made, um, the things that we talked about at defense table, the things that we saw coming, I think would make an, an incredible book in the Rittenhouse case because there were so many bizarre personalities and so many people involved in the case at the beginning. Mm -hmm for probably the wrong reasons. Um, it, it was entertaining. Um, it was a pleasure working with the people um, that we were that were there at the end. Um, our investigators, our experts, Joellen, um, you know, Corey's wife was very um, understanding, letting them come down here and live for, you know, over a month and a half. Um, and, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it in hindsight, um, but I'm not suggesting I necessarily want to do it again.
Well, okay, so it looks like our 90 minutes is up, and I'm sure you have better things to do with your time. So I just want to thank you for spending the time with me and answering some of my questions. And I'm sure everyone at Above the Law will feel the same way. If you'd like to hear more from Mark Richards, and if you happen to live in the Los Angeles area, the Westside Bar Association will be hosting an event featuring Mr. Richards on May 12th. He, along with a panel of experts, will discuss the Rittenhouse case in greater detail. You can purchase tickets at the Westside Bar Association website, which will be displayed at the Above the Law column or in the YouTube description. 